glad to see that you are hosting this session and discussing youth policies and youth rights uh, in the context of the Youth Day. So it's not just a celebration, but also a moment to reflect on um, the rights of, uh, of young people and how well they are included in their societies and especially in Turkey in this case. So uh, the Advisory Council on Youth is indeed formed of 30 people, um, youth activists uh, from youth organizations and networks uh, all over Europe working at international level or at national uh, level. 20 of them are elected in the General Assembly of European Youth Forum. 10 of them are selected directly by the Council of Europe. And what we do mainly is to advise the Committee of Ministers on all questions related to youth. Uh, so um, there are numerous initiatives the organization is working on and policies, and uh, we bring the youth perspective in those discussions. Another very, very interesting point is that we have a co-management uh, decision-making process in the youth sector. So when it comes to youth policies, when it comes to uh, you know how the budget of the organization on youth is spent, the uh, different I don't know standards uh, of the organization. The decisions are made together by youth representatives and government representatives. So what happens is that we also have separate meetings. Uh, we are members of the advisory council plan youth. The governments are part of the European Steering uh, Committee on Youth. And together we meet in the Joint Council on Youth. And the Joint Council is the structure that makes the decision. So that's where the priorities are set, that's where the policies are decided upon before they go to the Ministries of Foreign Affairs for a final approval. Um, which, which means that this is the most advanced participatory body for young people in any intergovernmental body. Um, really, there is no other institution that puts young people and representatives of, of government at the same table to make decisions that affect them. Uh, so this is really, really special to the Council of Europe uh, youth sector and how we work. Um, so yeah, I guess that's why uh, we are here, because we are some of the young people that are active in this body in the Council of Europe. Um, and I will ask my colleagues to um, maybe also say a few words and add uh, whatever they feel should be said about this. And I will um, take over. So hello, and also a very happy Youth Day. Um, I hope you can somehow enjoy it, even if you have to stay at home, probably. But I think it's nevertheless very important that we speak out and make sure that this is something that we celebrate um, wherever we can. And yeah, my name is Sarah. And I'm also from the Advisory Council on Youth. And specifically, I'm working on, on the portfolio Euro-Arab Youth Cooperation. But this also stretches also over Turkey. So there is the Euro-Arab Youth Forum, for example, where a lot of young people have the chance to work together with government officials on certain topics. Um, for example, also Youth Peace and Security, which is my second portfolio. And there you have the chance to join as a young person and also try to find um, solutions and work on projects that you come up with, um, which are relevant to your society and where we can make sure that you can share best practices and work together on an integrational um, project. So that's also why I'm here. I'm giving my, the words to Hande. Yes, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Hande uh, and I'm also part of the Advisory Council and the way that I came to the Advisory Council is 3D10 really uh, participants who are selected by the Secretary General of the Council of uh, Europe's uh, uh, the Advisory Council Secretary General and my own organization that I come from that nominated me is called FEMISO, the Forum of European Muslim Youth and Student Organizations, which is a network of about 30 plus uh, Muslim youth, national Muslim youth and national Muslim students organizations in Europe. They nominated me to be in the advisory council and I got selected. I have... I'm leading, I'm leading one portfolio, as any member is leading one portfolio. And my main portfolio is the management committee with Ukraine. I'm a co-lead in the management committee with Russia and then I'm also uh, uh, partially leading the, the portfolio, which is a transversal portfolio on the youth, youth partnership between the Council of Europe and the European Union. So two separate institutions, uh, 
of which Turkey is only member of the Council of Europe and only Canada member of the European Union. Uh, this is an interesting portfolio. I'm sure that in the, in the later stages of the session, we can talk more about it and I can share more information about what this partnership is actually about because the partnership, just to quickly maybe share something, is they focus have a specific focus on non-EU countries and uh, especially actually also Canada EU, Canada, EU countries. Uh, but yeah, there, there are a lot of things that we can learn from and also hepinizin gençlik bayramımızın kutlarım burada bulunmaktan gerçekten memnuniyet duyuyorum. Sorry, Mihai and Sarah. I had to drop that little bit of Turkish in there. <laughs> I'm joining you from Holland, by the way, from um, the Netherlands. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hande, Mihai, and Sarah, that what you said, and thanks for your valuable work. So, actually, I would like to ask that maybe can you explain some deeply, like structure of advisory council, how it works, and how young people from Turkey, how they can take a benefit from the advisory council. So yes. Can you explain so, it? Uh, there are a few things that the organization does. Um, first and foremost, it adopts European standards on different policies, uh, which you can find. Maybe we can also give some links to include when you post it. Uh, for example, the latest adopted text is a recommendation on supporting young refugees in transition to adulthood. And that means that all the uh, states, the Council of Europe recommends to states that it ensures certain measures are put in place. It can be this, it can be youth work, it can be young people's access to rights, it can be access to rights for young people living in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, okay, so th 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 there's a, it, it's not that a big amount, but there's quite a, a number of European standards on youth that is set through the organization. And these are standards that the governments look at when doing their own uh, policies at national level and legislation. So, for example, if your government uh, is going to adopt a national youth policy, uh, which hopefully it is, and it's also something that we will debate, the government uh, representatives will likely look to also see what the Council of Europe standards are in those topics of interest for your national youth policy. Uh, this is to say that uh, the, the Council of Europe recommendations are not legally binding. That means that you cannot sue your government for not doing what the Council of Europe recommends. Uh, however, all these policies are reviewed after five years. Uh, so member states need to report on whether they have implemented the measures in the recommendations, what's the status, how the different states compare, what should be done further. Uh, so there is a sort of... Um, peer pressure between government representatives that, you know, they do what they say they do. Um, because ultimately it's the governments who adopt these recommendations. Now, another very important aspect, and probably for a lot of young people and youth activists even more interesting, is, the is that we have educational programs. So around uh, 5,000 people participate in the European Youth Centers in Strasbourg and Budapest. Um, in sessions, so the European Youth Centers in Strasbourg and Budapest belong to the Council of Europe, and the Council of Europe organizes activities therein. It also hosts activities organized by various youth organizations, uh, of course, activities that are in line with the values of the Council of Europe. So it's the youth centers with around 5,000 beneficiaries per year, and also there's the European Youth Foundation, and the European Youth Foundation. Um, funds projects of youth organizations, and it is estimated that around 15,000 people benefit from uh, projects funded by um, uh, the European Youth Foundation all over Europe. So these 20,000 people are multipliers, and they take up, uh, you know, the, the policies of the Council of Europe, the standards uh, and the tools, and they disseminate it further at national level. Of course, everybody who's interested can still benefit a lot from the Council of Europe by accessing uh, the Youth Department website and having a look at the online tools. So there are online trainings. There's, uh, for example, in terms of youth work, in terms of uh, human rights education, there's also a human rights manual um, on the platform of the Council of Europe in working with minorities. So there's a lot of resources that are available online as well for those who, um, you know, don't 
have access uh, right now at the Council of uh, Europe Youth Centers or Youth Committee. So it's these two ways, recommendations that governments look at when building their own policies and training activities online and offline uh, and funding for youth projects, so it's two main pillars. Thank you so much, your answer, Mihaly. So do you have any additional information, Sarah and Hande? I can perhaps talk a bit about the, the partnership. Uh, not, I won't add too much, uh, as I'm sure that we'll have more interesting questions later, both from the participants and, and from you. Uh, but something really important, uh, Mihai touched upon, and that's the, the, the tools of the Council of Europe. And this is something that the partnership actually works a lot on. They do like a ridiculous amount of research, they do ridiculous amount of uh, policy manuals, tools, trainings, which are actually freely accessible. And um, Compass exactly. I'm saying in the chat is, is, is an example. They they um, that that's one of the examples of the tools that they have. They for example have um, in, when it comes to like publications, they have toolkits. They have project management uh, about project management toolkits about evaluation, mobility, youth work, different areas, uh, but also uh, different um, say skill sets. They also have historical publications. There's a Coyote magazine. Coyote uh, is, is a magazine between the Council of Europe and the, and the European Union, in which sometimes actually in the past as well, advisory council members wrote. And another kind of areas that the partnership works on is research. Uh, and they do, uh, there's the area about youth work, youth policy. So, you know, there's actually a lot of tools available, a lot of information available that First of all, you as an organization can access, freely access. You can um, read it, you can discuss it in your organization. And if you see that it's something that the organization itself, the forum actually can benefit from, uh, then there, there can be like more in-depth research about in-depth applications to the members. Because I, I myself, as I said, I'm coming from a forum organization. I mean, so it's, it's a forum of organizations. So I can a little bit understand how it might work to trickle down documents or, or policy tools from institutions, but I'll, I'll, uh, I can talk more about it later. I'll just keep it at this now. Actually, thank you so much, Hande. Like you, you answered my second question, actually. I was thinking to ask you that, how do you support young people? Can you briefly your tools? So, so you actually answered my question. Thank you so much that you didn't give me. It was, it was like, not a full answer. <laughs> Like actually, my, my my next question is like, how do you support young people? Like, can you briefly explain your tools? Like, can you deeply like explain it? So does anybody else want to have a go or? You go, I spoke too much now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I spoke about them a little bit before. So you have two European youth centers in Budapest and Strasbourg, um, which host activities. For example, if you are interested, together with a number of other organizations, in having a study session on, let's say, shrinking space for youth civil society, which is a topic that is very, um, you know, very, very popular right now, and also part of one of the main subjects that we are discussing in the Council of Europe Youth Sector. Um, then you can meet some other organizations uh, in one of the youth centers. You have to apply, of course. And the European, uh, the Council of Europe covers the costs that you have uh, with, you know, accommodation, uh, food, training materials. Um, you know, so you would benefit from this kind of support. You can also apply to get a grant from the European Youth Foundation for a project. Um, um, and we now have a special call that is on a rolling basis, so you will keep having new de deadlines for applications. For projects that respond to COVID-generated uh, problems at national level or in communities at local level. So you can also apply to receive funding from the European Youth Foundation for projects that, that are related to the needs in your community. Of course, these things need to be in line with the values of the Council of Europe, uh, which in, in a more general sense and also, uh, you know, the thematic areas of the um, youth sector. So the values of the Council of Europe are human rights, democracy and the rule of law. 
this is basically what the organization in general stands on, not just on youth, but in all its activities. Um, so this kind of funding is another is another um, support given to young people interested. Uh, Handa mentioned a lot of uh, manuals, uh, research that can be used, online courses. So you also have a lot of these. Um, and there's also another interesting tool. I actually saw you posted it there, so um, <laughs> which reminded me not to, to forget it. There's also a quality label for youth centers. So except the two centers in Budapest and Strasbourg, um, it can be youth organizations, it can be public authorities, they need to be linked in a way with public authorities, but it doesn't need to belong to one. Um, you can build youth centers that are certified, you know, that have a quality, quality label from the Council of Europe, if it meets certain standards, like it involves young people in decision making, it addresses young people, it has certain facilities, um, you know, it, it uh, offers educational programs, it gives input to policymakers on youth, so you also have this quality label system, which means that um, quite a number of youth centers, I'm not sure of the final number now and don't want to make a mistake, but there are youth centers in several European countries that have this quality label um, awarded, which means that they had support to build a certain level of activity and quality um, uh, in, in their activities, and also then they got recognized for it. So this is also another interesting tool. Uh, I guess for the youth sector, these are the main um, the main ways that young people are supported. Of course, in a more general sense, the organization also has stronger, uh, you know, instruments. And for example, the European Convention for Human Rights is protected to the European Court of Human Rights. So if somebody uh, has their vi rights violated, for example, they don't have access to a fair trial or um, uh, you know, other situations like this, then the European Court of Human Rights would review the trial that happened in the national country and would say if it meets the standards of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights or not. And if not, it uh, basically uh, sanctions the country, you know, it gives a ruling that is then mandatory for the country. Um, so it's in terms of the legal system, the, the higher uh, level is the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and Turkey, being a member state of the Council of Europe, is also a party to this instrument. It also has a judge, actually, the European Court of Human Rights. So um, this is a stronger instrument, but it is not related necessarily to the youth sector. So it's in general any citizen. Uh, thank you so much. much for your answer. I'd like to add something to this, Sarah. Yeah, um, I think uh, Mihai explained a lot of things which are really important. And another thing is also that you can reach out to us whenever you feel that there is something, a certain topic that you're interested in, in or your organization is working and it kind of falls under the three pillars that we're working with. You can always try to reach out to one of our members because we have a lot of expertise because we're 30 people. So we're stretching a variety of um, different topics and you can all find them also on the, the homepage. And another thing that is really important is probably that um, a lot of the toolkits are in English, but you can see if there is um, other organizations that are interested in the same topics and you can make sure that there is a translation made in Turkish. So I think this is also something where you can work together and see how to translate whatever is needed for you. And since you're part of the European Youth Forum as well now, you can yourself run for a position probably in the advisory council in the future so this is also something to keep in mind that there is other um, opportunities as well to engage yourself in yeah thank you so much so actually thank you so much for your answer so actually i would like to ask you another question about the COVID process so as we know that now as a world we are facing like a problem which we didn't face it before so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a pandemic and it's a different process that we are facing now. So I would like to ask that, how did Advisory Council respond to COVID-19 COVID process? Like, how was your action and how you get the feedback? Uh, yes, so in terms of the youth sector, probably the most, you know, very specific and easy to grasp measure, was that the funds that are given by the European Youth Foundation 
uh, well, a part of them at least, were directed to COVID-19 response projects. Uh, this means that uh, this part of our uh, tools, the funding, um, has been adapted to react to this reality. At the same time, we are um, now conducting an analysis of the impact that the pandemic has on young people and youth organizations. Uh, and this is happening in a joint uh, working group where we have youth representatives from the advisory council, but also government representatives. So we're working together with them to develop an understanding and then proposals to member states on you know, how they can react. And we're also actually looking at how member states react. So are they facilitating um, you know, youth participation and young people being part of the solution? Are they restricting some rights excessively? You know, what's going on? And we're now working to understand that. Uh, um, of course, uh, this part of the process started after we directed the European Youth Foundation's that, uh, that Foundation directed fund to COVID-19 response project, which was the first thing that happened. I think it was, you know, after our general meetings, with the advisory council on youth and the uh, hearing council on youth, I think it, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks, um, and it was already out. Of course, this was the use of the work of the youth department from the Council of Europe, which were aligned with us in terms of realizing we need to respond. Uh, but more than that, the Council of Europe also issued some tools that can help both member states, but also. Uh, activists, journalists, other people who want to see whether the government's response is proportional uh, in terms of reducing democratic rights, in terms of uh, the balance between powers in a state, uh, you know, in terms of uh, aspects like these, freedom of expression, freedom of media, uh, you know, because some governments have taken advantage of the situation and have sort of attacked their opposition or free media or um, you know, and generally eroded the democratic process. So the Council of Europe issued um, um, a tool basically to member states, but as I said, it's public and anybody can read it and use the information there, which says, you know, it's proportional to have some limitations, but you can't, you know, stop the media because it's an important part in helping the public understand on how the government reacts to the process. It, you know, okay, you can have some further executive powers, but you can't, you know, leave parliament aside. You still need a parliament that has checks on the executive power and the government and exerts its role during a pandemic as well. So it's all sorts of things like this, also in a more general sense, uh, that the Council of Europe is supporting in order to maintain, uh, as I mentioned earlier, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law throughout the continent. Um, so this is also something that has been happening quite a lot. Um, and other than that, it, it's also been quite a tricky situation for us because as you might imagine, the activities from the youth centers in Budapest and Strasbourg have been suspended, uh, which means that there were no you know, face-to-face -face activities where people meet, uh, no further educational activities. So it's also been quite a tricky period for us as well, and, and it is quite a struggle to adapt fully to the needs of society in this context. Uh, but this is what uh, has been happening so far, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, my colleagues have something further to add. Yeah, so I fully agree with Mihai. It's also something that um, personally we're looking into it at my own portfolio with the Euro Arab states, where we had discussions with the Arab League as well. And they were telling us that they are looking into how they can support youth organizations themselves and see if there is some pro projects that are working on the, the problems that COVID-19 is causing and where they want to see how to support the youth organizations in the best way, be it financially or be it by um, supporting them with their knowledge. And I think it's very important that we make sure that the governments understand that their youth organizations are doing a lot of valuable work during that time, be it online or also in terms of helping. And I think it's very, very clear that this is something where we have to look at and see how we can support them as well in the advisory council. Yeah. And then? Yeah, a lot of the things have been said. 
what maybe perhaps I can add is that a lot of research is also is done at the same time. Uh, so toolkit has been published, uh, a lot of meetings have been dispensed, but at the same time, the, for, I know, for example, the partnership is looking in, is doing research into how the situation affects youth organizations and young people. Uh, we have even set inside the advisory council certain working groups to look at this pro to look at the problem. A lot of things are are being done, but at the same time, as Mihai said, it's a really tricky situation. You really don't really know where to go to, um, what we can expect, what should be done. A lot of new problems come to the surface as well, which is something important that a lot of problems that might have been, uh, let's say, like below the surface, they become more, uh, they can they become more present in the in the pandemic, and it shows different dynamics of the societies that we live in which should be tackled outside of the crisis as well but uh, yeah yeah a lot of work has been done so actually i would like you to will... ask i'm oh, sorry Mihai, go on please yeah if you go on um if you search council of europe youth and you go on the main page you will see that there have also there have also been some reactions on uh, issues affecting young people in times of COVID. So the Advisory Council and youth had a statement on this, showing the need to involve young people as a, a positive part of society, but then, uh, you know, also making sure that they are not left behind uh, in the measures um, taken by states and that democracy is maintained as well. Um, there, our reactions, for example, related to the impact on some minorities, for example, the LGBTQI minority, and there has um, also been a more general response at the Council of Europe on this issue because they face a lot of trouble, um, you know, with some young people being kicked out of their houses or domestic violence increasing. Um, so there's all sorts of phenomena that the Council of Europe, uh, uh, the youth sector, and us as well, but also other bodies. Um, have been noticing and have been raising awareness on in order to uh, encourage member states to take action. And one of the advantages of the Advisory Council on Youth is that because it is a body within the Council of Europe, um, you know, the stakeholders do read our messages. They are aware of what we are communicating. Uh, so in that sense, it helps, it helps reaching the policymakers uh, through this channel as well, as complementary to what activists do in the streets or you know, in, um, even in online campaigns. It's also this channel that is complementary to those that helps boost the message and um, you know, encourage states to take action. Well, thank you so much for your answers. Actually, according to your, uh, your survey and your works that I would like to ask some question like also you know our topic is that like nation youth policy is it a need or right so according to this like like related to even you know like the cutting budget also it's related that now also we are facing that like the, in the COVID pandemic process like it's it's really possible to cutting budget on youth works or youth or on young people so like should we say that does it show like it's a first step that they can easily cutting budget from youth works that so can we say that like is it like the nation youth policy is it a need or right like all the process that that we facing that like it's a first step that they can easily do what they want on young people so can we say that that's why we should have a youth policy and it's a right well a youth policy is uh you know the way that the government uh makes sure that youth rights are respected so you do need a youth policy and you know, while it's not uh, in a convention that it's a right and uh, you can sue your government for not having one, it's obvious that in order to make sure that youth rights are, uh, that the young people enjoy their rights, uh, you need the national youth policy. So without it, uh, you know, it's like walking in, you know, a dark room, not knowing what to grab, what to do next to get out of there because you can't see around. 
so you need to collect data, you need to make sure that young people are listening to, you need to make sure that this policy reaches um, uh, a number of uh, different, um, you know, thematic areas that are relevant to young people. So not just youth work, but also employment, also uh, environment can be also a, a problem, social rights, uh, discrimination, hate speech. So there's all sorts of things that need to be addressed, and that young people need to uh, need governments to respond to needs. That yeah. So uh, basically, I would say this: that a national youth policy is needed in order for young people to enjoy their rights. So I think this is the way to frame it. Um, and definitely, I think it should happen regardless of whether it's COVID or non-COVID. Young people are a very big part of societies, and you can't leave their needs unaddressed. You can't do that. Just can't. It's like, and you can't do that to any category of people, actually. But young people also, and young people are also especially vulnerable. Uh, for example, when they don't yet have work experience, if their school is interrupted because of COVID and you know they need to recover, or what impact does that have on them? Um, in terms of trust towards institutions, will they continue to trust institutions more or less? So uh, these things will affect the way society evolves in the long term, not just the short term, um, and will have a very significant impact. So. In that extent, I would say that it's very important to continue addressing young people's needs, uh, also in times of pandemic. And also, the, re the reality generally is that the part of the budget that is given to young people is not that big. And if we're talking about the budgets for youth organizations or youth projects, that's even smaller. Uh, so if you cut that budget, you will not solve the problems with you know buying everything you need to address the pandemic. It's like a very tiny proportion. It doesn't solve anything, but for young people to have their voices heard and for them to feel that they are valued as part of the, as, you know, parts of their societies and, and valued by their governments, uh, you need to keep those funds also accessible. You might not have them as large as they were before, but it might actually be wise to even increase those budgets in some cases. Um, you know, to make sure that you don't have exclusion, that you don't have um, increasing violence, that you don't have increasing populist and anti-democratic currents. Um, so I definitely, of course we say this, but it's not just that we say, we really believe that it's important to continue to focus and invest in young people, um, even if societies face challenges. Of course you adapt those, instruments and where the money goes. You need to keep young people uh, involved and supported. Um, thank you so much, Mihail. So I would like to ask the question to Hande and Sarah, like in the pandemic process as a young woman, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, actually, I don't know how do you pronounce yourself. I'm so sorry for that, but how actually, like, can you explain your, like how young, women that are facing in the pandemic process like about the uh, domestic violence and and in that process how they are reaching their rights that they cannot like I, my question is like normally they can reach their rights but because of that the pandemic process they cannot go out so can you give us to some example and information about that how they solve this problem and how you are facing with that process can you explain? Yeah, I can um, step in right now. Um, so I think it's a very important thing to ask. Um, I myself identify as a woman. So in that term, you're safe. Um, and um, yeah, no, what I think is really important that it's not only during the pandemic because um, yes, the pandemic is making it worse, but women's rights are not always protected. So even though it's Europe, it doesn't mean that women have all their rights. Um, especially during the pandemic right now, women face the problems that whenever people say, or the government say you have to stay at home because this is the safe place to be, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the safe place because we're still facing a lot of violence when you stay at home. And you also have to take, um, or have in mind that when you have to stay at home for a long time, it's also affecting your mental health. And it doesn't matter which gender you have, it will always affect you in a certain way or not. And it makes it um, way worse. And they 
just can't go outside and seek for help. And it's not always easy to just do that because a lot of women don't um, feel the strength to do it. And um, there's a lot of hotlines, of course, where you can try to reach out to, and there is online um, counseling, but it's not always really an easy um, way to do that or a safe space at home, because it can be that you will be controlled in every step that you take as a woman. So what I think it's really important is that the governments address this and make sure that they have some policies or some measurements where they make sure that there is actually safe spaces when you know that home is not your safe space. And um, yeah, we have seen that there is some governments that try to take up on the challenge, but a lot of governments um, didn't because they probably didn't have the opportunity to do so, or they, they did have the opportunity, but they didn't think it's that necessary. And I think what's also very important is that the governments listen to the expert, uh, experts, and there's a lot of women's rights organizations all over Europe and on the world in general. So I think that they can just take up the suggestions that are made there and just make sure that they adapt it to the, to the country's environment. I know because a lot of countries um, are facing it differently and there is different varieties of how women's rights are seen, but there is um, a human rights charter and I think this is something that we have to focus on. And also in Europe, we have the Istanbul Convention where we can say that it's very important that the government governments make sure that they implement what's written in there and that they ratify the Istanbul Convention because not all European countries have done that. And I think this is something that is, um, yeah, a focus that they should have on. Yeah. Maybe, I don't Thank know you. if wants to say something, yeah. Thank you so much for your answers. So, Hande, would you like to give some additional information on that? Like, yeah. if you want, even you can give your, like, according to your mm -hmm. survey by the advisory council. So of course. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the question. It's really important. I stand behind what Sarah fully said. Perhaps a different take what I can uh, like bring here is examples here in Europe that we've seen that's been implemented here in the Netherlands. I think it started in France where certain places uh, in, in society like in uh, like physical places are dedicated as um, safe spaces where women can go to. I think not only just women, but everyone who's suffering from, uh, from sorry, I have the Dutch word in my head, domestic violence. I speak about domestic violence. <laughs> um, they can go and they say, for example, um, mask 19, and then uh, at the farms, I don't know if you guys have read this, and then they go to the pharmacy, they say mask 19, and then uh, they, they understand that it's a code, and then the pharmacist asks, I'm sorry, but we've run out of masks. Um, can we get the address to where this mask could be sent? So it's, there's like, there's a code language there to understand, uh, to try to communicate that the person going to that place is suffering from home, uh, from domestic violence and these types of initiatives are amazing amazing from the sense that it shows that there is some sort of understanding that indeed as sarah said home cannot be a safe space and domestic violence can be a real issue we it, it should really not be taken for granted that homes are safe spaces they're not safe spaces for everyone and i guess perhaps to link it to the youth aspect um besides like the gender aspect is as young people we are from a different generation and we have different perspectives on life, on, on, on families, on, on society. And we might be even more sensitive to the domestic violence. What well, previously it might have been something a bit normal or taboo that you don't talk about, but now people can be having a bit more of a, let's say, open eye to try to, as, as a person, as an individual, as a young person, to try to have an eye open for cases of domestic violence. So can I be some sort of, of help to identify if there's domestic violence can i try to kind of uh, sense these these dynamics that i might not be sensing it in my own house and this i think come can come from the perspective of as young people again we just we are different we're different from our generations and, and already in these times perspectives and cultures and mentalities are changing so fast where we really can be a force of a uh, source of positive change a source of a, a positive force and this can this type of thinking can also be it could be a, um, how to say a source of hope for individuals to to just accept that we are different that our culture is just different our, our mentality is different and we can have a different eye to sensing different problems in society in order to help them better 
thank you so much and then sarah so actually i would like to say that thank you so much that you mentioned that about the istanbul convention so it's also our first priority that now we are facing with it that also like now in a pandemic process as young uh, women and lgbt people are facing that how they are discriminated in that pandemic process so thank you so much that you mentioned about it sarah so actually now i guess we are going to to close so i'm asking to participate participants that if you have any questions that you can raise your hands or you can write by via chat here so i guess by rising hand you can do it by zoom like not your hands so if you ask your if you have any questions even if you have a questions in turkish like you can write it on by chat and i can translate and i can ask to him uh, to them sorry mm -hmm. no worries. Uh, in the meantime, while they are uh, preparing their questions, I was thinking that maybe Hande can tell us a few words about how the special cooperation with the Russian Federation and Ukraine uh, is going and what it looks like. Um, you know, it might also be an interesting model for now or for later, who knows, for Turkey as well, but it's definitely, you know, a, a model that is worth considering. So that's okay with yeah. you. Yeah, so the the partnership, sorry, not partnership, I'm too focused on the partnership. The, um, the management committee that we have is, is for youth policy specifically, of course, we are the advisory council of youth, but it's based on certain documents between the, the Council of Europe and, and Ukraine um, partnership in, in general. So there are certain documents that it's based on. Let me just um, take them here. Uh, there's, for example, the social program of Youth of Ukraine plan between 2016 and 2020. There is a framework program on cooperation between the Council of Europe and the Ministry of Youth and Sports of Ukraine in the field of youth policy. Uh, and there is also a general Council of Europe action plan Ukraine. This was uh, the last one was in between 2015 and 2017. But um, I should have started with the action plan. The action plan is the main document for this, for the specific youth cooperation documents. And I, as I said, I'm like new to the role, so I don't know exactly the history of these action plans. But what I know is from the from a predecessor who took the management who had the management committee portfolio with Ukraine, is that there was a lot of cooperation with mainly two institutions: that is, the National Youth Council of Ukraine and the Ministry of Youth and Sports. And as the advisory, advisory council, we're always in the middle. We can't take one side. We can't be either civil society fully or fully governmental. And this was really important. Uh, this will be important as well in this management committee where you should be as neutral as possible, but of course sticking to your values, not getting rid of the values that you have and the visions that you have. And from the, the activities until now, a certain program will be set up uh, or implemented more, which is the um, Youth for Democracy. And when it comes to like the actual from an AC member perspective is we participate into meetings, we give advice from our perspective. Uh, sometimes we join policy missions. So there's a tool called policy mission, which is for the Council of Europe specifically, where a delegation for youth policy specifically visits a country and then they advise on the on different topics and then an AC member can go with them. So I probably, if in the future there will be meetings in, in Kiev, I, I will, I can join. <clears throat> and there is, for example, um, there's also the Eastern Partnership that the Council of Europe has as well, where, where they cooperate with um, non-Russian Eastern European countries and um, these have some sort of events so to be a bit more concrete again something like this doesn't happen uh, doesn't exist yet with with turkey but if it could be the case then uh, national organizations like forums like go for uh, can be really important but of course as i said <clears throat> political dynamics are really important it's, it's it's important to take the ministry into account uh besides the civil society and the, the council of europe's position 
in the end is always trying to find that balance between the, the governmental and the civil society perspective. But I'm sure uh, a lot of good things can, can happen from such a possible uh, cooperation between uh, in, the, in the field of youth. And for example, the, if I go back to the partnership, again, the partnership actually has two really important documents. Uh, unfortunately, the last of them has been published in 2017. One is um, a country sheet on youth policy in Turkey. Uh, it's, it's a document uh, published by both the EU and the Council of Europe. And another one is um, a questionnaire on participation in Turkey. So these are just examples from the partnership, but uh, from the EU Council of Europe partnership. But if something like a, a management committee can be established, then there will be ultimately what that means is there's just more focus on the country. There's more focus and there's more <clears throat> energy implemented on that country in trying to understand the situation better. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm fasting so I can't drink, you know. <coughs> so thank you so much for your answer and I hope that may God accept your fasting. So um, actually I would like to... I would like to say that thank you so much for your participation on behalf of Nation Youth Council of Turkey. And also, like, I would like to ask that how do you evaluate that? Like, you know, as, as, as young people from Turkey cannot participate so much decision-making process in Europe. So how do you evaluate this process? Like, even in specific, specifically young women, like it's it's also important that for us that like women LGBT plus people are sh should be more promoted. So how do you see this process? Can you explain it? Um, yeah. So I think one thing that is very important is that um, young people feel the strength to speak up. So you shouldn't be afraid to speak up because you're speaking up for your rights and for the needs that you have. So it's very important that you find people that support you in that as well, because it's, it's a hard um, process sometimes, especially when you're starting. But as a woman, and um, also especially for the LGBTQI um, people, it's very important that you stand together and that you work on your rights and that you address it and find the people or the organizations that support you. And I think there is a lot of ways that you can do that. And don't be afraid um, of doing so because um, in the end, it's all about um, trying to improve the world. And it's still, we're all humans and it doesn't matter what gender you have or what um, what's the love that you're having. So um, yeah, I think this is one very important thing. And especially as a young person, because we're in the development phase um, we're able to uh, adapt to a lot of situations and we're also the ones that are trying to educate themselves very much. So I think this is um, something that you have to keep in mind. Thank you so much, Sarah. So do you have any additional... Ah, thank you. Yes, yes, Mihai, go on. Our, our chance to influence societies is to participate. Uh, and I think that... First of all, in general, as young people, we should take the responsibility, but also the risk maybe to uh, fight for a society that looks more the way we want it. Um, and then I think it's also important for us to be allies to each other. So rather than dividing ourselves and fighting with each other, uh, we should make sure that we respect voices that have a different point of view than our own uh, and encourage this diversity and dialogue. So one of the things that is also very interesting for us in this co-management system is that the decisions in the youth uh, sector in the Council of Europe are taken by consensus. So it's us, the young people and the government representatives need to reach a common understanding or a common uh, view on a certain subject in order for it to be adopted. So if, uh, I don't know, Hande, Sarah, or myself object to something, it doesn't pass. But then if the uh, Turkey's representative or Russia's representative or Germany's representative says no, it also doesn't pass. Uh, so it's a very important, and at some times it can be very annoying, I have to admit, when you have to take into account you know everything and you can't just move on fast 
but the end result is then accepted by everybody and uh, you know things can move forward and uh, it's normal to have an opinion and it's also normal to hear what others have to say and try to reach a balance and uh, what i said about being an ally to other people i think this is especially true for uh being an ally to the more vulnerable uh categories uh you know it can be um sexual minorities it can be um young people from disadvantaged neighborhoods it can be ethnic minorities um so there's it can be people with suffering from disability so it, it can be quite a large number of categories that may need uh you know more support from the others in order to feel confident and be able to participate in society but society has a lot to gain if everybody you know feels and is included so uh, yeah definitely encourage uh, people thank you thank you so much them. for your answer mihai so actually i would like to ask that if is there any question from our participants so you can raise your hands i guess there is a button that you can raise your hands, but I'm not good at technology, sorry. But I'm, I know that there is something that you can raise your hands or you can do like this, maybe I can see it. Or you can um, write the chat. Baran, so. can you hear me? Yes, I do, I chat. Hello, I have a question uh, for three of you, Sarah, Mihai and Hande. Uh, thanks for this meeting. And my question is about um, as a common goal, but do you have any concrete results of or work accomplished with the stakeholders or uh, local authorities when you have certain discrepancies of common goal? Did you understand my question? Uh, I'm not sure. Can you please uh, repeat it? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you have any concrete results or works accomplished with stakeholders and local authorities? Although you have certain discrepancies on a common goal, on a, you know, um, youth policy. I need some specific examples that you face to uh, some problems during this process. Because uh, till now we, we talk about a little bit concrete things, um, you know, you can find all kinds of information on the uh, European Council websites, etc. But I need some much more concrete uh, and examples that you face. Thank you. Uh, yes, well, um, I think one of the tricky subjects now is a recommendation we are working on uh, on the expanding civil space for youth. And as you know, governments have different policies, sometimes restricting or even shaming young people or youth NGOs, youth organizations or other that take funding from um, international donors. Um, so this is an issue where, you know, we're not aligned with all the member states and there may be some tension. Um, also in terms of how you can use social media and different participation like uh, petitions, online petitions uh, and platform-based advocacy in order to consider it as a public authority. So we are also pushing for this. And, um, you know, these, these kinds of subjects uh, are issues where sometimes we manage to reach a consensus that is aligned with our views but sometimes it may not be the case. It was the same, for example, um, on including different minorities and vulnerable groups explicitly in the priorities of the Council of Europe Youth Sector. Uh, so the Advisory Council on Youth pushed for that and didn't manage to do it in the end. So it happened, but then it was rejected by the group of rapporteurs who check uh, the priorities. They're sort of a control uh, you know, structure uh, before it, the document reaches final adoption. So, uh, and there was opposition from member states, which is also partly legitimate, we have to say. Um, so we said we need to name them specifically in order to address all these groups specifically, but they said, okay, but we might leave some groups out. And then what happens when, you know, we realize that we weren't really balanced or fully inclusive? 
so these are the kinds of debates that we sometimes uh, have in the structure uh, with, you know, um, with governments and sometimes even among each other um, and where we might have to compromise. So the compromise solution in the case of minorities might be that you mentioned that you need to address minorities. Uh, you give points, for example, in terms of uh, funds from the European uh, Youth Foundation or projects hosted by the European Youth Center. So you encourage participation of minority or vulnerable groups, uh, but you might not uh, in the final result name all of them as you may have intended. Um, so these kinds of debates happen quite often. Now, of course, we did not, we don't have a recommendation adopted in our mandate. Uh, it's quite important to note that we started in January, but actually the first meeting we attended was in March. Uh, and it, it had to happen uh, online, so via email. That means that we were ourselves, the three of us, not part of actual negotiations and discussions for recommendations and European standards adopted before. So what I told you about the situation is more from what we know from our predecessors. Uh, we are yet to fight to, to face our own, but most likely the time will also come. Um, and yeah, this is the kind of, of discussions we have. In terms of local impact, uh, there are some very important things to note. So the Council of Europe has a limited budget. In total, the youth sector, so the European Youth Centers and the European Youth Foundation, which are probably the main you know, budget part, uh, have around, I think, three, just over 3.5 million euros for all their projects. Uh, that means all over Europe. So 3.5 million euros is not a lot of money. That means that you will not see trainings happening all around and people, you know, hundreds of thousands of people every year benefiting from Council of Europe programs because that is simply not possible with the budget that this structure has. Um, that means that the local impact happened more indirectly. This is by the European standards influencing government representatives and also the educational programs helping youth organizations, um, often youth umbrella organizations, but not exclusively, become better in their work and in their advocacy towards their you know, governments and local authorities. Um, so this is why the impact sometimes is not direct, but rather indirect, but it still exists. And also some of the relevant, because you mentioned local authorities, there is a charter on the participation of young people at, uh, to local, to regional and local life, um, which encourages, uh, you know, youth participation and encourages several topics, policy areas that are uh, relevant to, to young people to be addressed. So uh, this is one of the documents that can be used by any local organization going to your uh, municipality, to your regional council and saying, hey, look, at the Council of Europe, uh, you have this charter. Uh, let's work together on this, or let's build on this. Of course, as I said, they are not legally binding, so you would still need to do the advocacy, but you have a lot of, um, you know, support, and you, you have this coverage of a Council of Europe policy when you go to the decision maker. So it's not just yourself having an idea or asking for something, but rather you can say, hey, this is the, you know, golden standard at European level, it's happening all over the place, so we should also be doing this. Let's do it. Um, so, well, yeah, in that sense, it's a complementarity between the work we do to have good recommendations at European level and the work that youth organizations still have to do in advocating to local and national authorities to get those recommendations implemented. So we, we, we would not be successful without you, and... Uh, in you know, making sure that those policies become a reality. And definitely we like to believe, and actually we do believe that the instruments of the Council of Europe and the uh, European standard that we contribute to also help you in your activity. Um, you know, to get uh, so, so thank you so much, Mihai, for your answer. And thank you so much for your question, Aicha. So there is, uh, I, Ozan, I saw your question, but there is a Özgün online, so maybe first we should give the microphone to Özgün, then I will ask your question to our speakers, Ozan. So it's your turn, Özgün. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. 
I'm Ashgin from Istanbul. Uh, thank you for your speech. It was a pleasure to listen to you. My question is, uh, yes, it's a little general topic, but how do you see the European youth organization's role in this crisis? There are many European youth organizations and sometimes people expect so much things from this type of organizations, especially the members, I mean, uh, and they are not satisfied what they got or what they saw from their organizations. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, they, if we think it's the exam, they pass the exam or not? Um, maybe I can add something on that. Um, I think it's very important that you, that the people that maybe criticize them, I don't know who that would be, um, that they have in mind that a lot of youth organizations don't have enough funding. And this is one of the things and that a lot of people are working voluntarily in the organizations. So I think this is one of the main topics that you have in mind that you should have in mind when you talk about if they're working properly or if they're not, because they're working probably to the best that they can. And um, I'm sure that a lot of youth organizations are also facing a lot of issues because the people that are working as volunteers also have their personal lives and you don't know if they are struggling in their personal lives. And you also have to respect that. Um, and also that a lot of boards have to take severe decisions and also make sure that the safety of the people that are working in the youth organizations is um, made sure. So depending on um, the situations that they're facing, I think a lot of youth organizations are doing quite well and are trying to adapt to the online measurements and trying to hold youth um, work online. Um, in that terms, I think they are doing quite well. There's also a lot of exchange between the youth organizations in Europe. And I also encourage um, youth organizations to do that because there is a lot of expertise and a lot of um, new things that have been uh, made just for the pandemic. And I think if we're sharing these experiences, I think you can say that they're doing quite well. So um, yeah, that's